All right, welcome to period one statistics on Wednesday. We're going to be talking about sampling distribution models for means. Yesterday, we started talking about sampling distribution models for proportions. So we had those percentages. Today, we'll be talking about doing the same type of thing, but with means. All right, so first, we're going to do a little bit of lecture. We'll go over just a few differences between today and yesterday. Do an example problem, and then hopefully have time to start looking at uh, a problem you guys are going to do tomorrow with Excel. All right? So we already mentioned some of this stuff. But if you take a look here, the interesting thing about using this for means is that even if the shape of your population distribution is not normal or unimodal and symmetric, or let's say you don't even know what the shape of your population distribution looks like, we can still use everything that we've talked about up to this point. All right, We can still use a normal model for the sampling distribution model for a mean. So that's what this central limit theorem is talking about. All right, and after I finish my lecture and our example problem, before we transition into a new problem, I'm going to show you about a three-minute video that kind of summarizes uh, what I've been talking about for the past two days. All right. Now, as you can see near the bottom of this page, as you read all these bullet points, if your distribution of your population, like if you had a histogram of all of your population and it looked roughly symmetric and unimodal, then your sampling distribution model, when you make that, you don't need as big a sample to feel confident that it's going to look normal. All right? And every time you have a sample, if you increase that sample size, then you can be even more confident that your sampling distribution model will be normal. And if you're not really understanding the words that I'm saying, it's okay, because we're going to do this for the next three months, all right? This kind of stuff. All right. Anybody still writing? Yes, yes you're still writing. Okay. Now, something that I'm not sure I've actually ever stated in here, but if this was a college course and I had these notes with me, all right. Before I came to my next lecture, I would read what we did the previous day. All right. That's what I recommend in college. So try, you know, especially you guys have lunch before this. The last five minutes of lunch, pull out your packet and just read the slides we did yesterday. All right. Yeah. Good question. Here's what it is. It is the central limit theorem. The book that I chose dubs it the fundamental theorem of statistics. That is not a thing. The fundamental theorem of statistics is not a thing. But they just decided to call it that. But the thing you need to know is the central limit theorem, which states that as your sample size grows, as your sample size grows, then your sampling distribution model will be more normal. Like more like a bell curve, okay. and I think the video after it will sum it up nicely. Okay. All right, bless you. Thank you. All right. Now, just like we did yesterday, we need to make assumptions and check conditions. Okay. Just like we did yesterday, we're going to assume things before we actually make the model, and we're going to check certain conditions that make us feel comfortable about the assumptions that we're making. All right. Now, what's really nice about this, guys, is that you're going to see the assumptions and conditions are almost identical. They're almost exactly the same, which is great because you're going to need to know how to write these and what to check on Friday for your quiz. So you'll see we have the independence assumption. That's still here. And we have the sample size assumption. So those are the two assumptions we're going to be making again today. Same as yesterday, Pablo. Exactly the same. All right. We're saying that if I look at my sample, all right, if I look at each component of my sample, if one thing happens with one of those pieces, it does not affect any of the other pieces. 
for the sample size assumption, Pablo, we're saying that the sample size that we're given is large enough. That's the assumption we're making. The sample size is large enough to make this sampling distribution model. I'm sorry, I just said. Okay, remember we are recording. Okay. That's really sweet, Alberto. It's very nice. Was that not, not you? Let's go to the next line. Now, you should know. <laughs> Oh man, good time. Nobody watches my videos, Alyssa. Don't worry. Twelve people watch a video from last week. Twelve. One of, one of the twelve? Okay. I want to focus on these three conditions. They're not all exactly the same. Do you guys see the third condition? Do you see that large enough sample condition? What was that yesterday? What was the third condition yesterday? Anybody remember? Ooh. Ooh. No? Well, you weren't here, Diana. It's okay. Success, failure. So notice the third condition is not success, failure condition. So that's different. But the first two are the same. Um, uh... Oh, yeah. I don't know. I think I moved it down to give you more space. Yeah, because some people write large. I was trying to help you out. So I just want to make sure you guys all saw that what I'm talking about is the third one is new. All right, and it's replacing the success failure condition. With success failure condition, the reason we use that for proportions is because proportions has a success and a failure. Right? Yesterday, remember the car is speeding or it's not. But with means. We don't have just one success and one failure. We're going to talk today. Our example is going to be about SAT scores. All right, so we can have a range of scores, and we want to look at the average. All right, so that's why we have a different condition to check. Any questions so far? Now, you'll notice if you read that large enough sample condition, there's not any math to do. Remember, yesterday with the success failure condition, we did n times p and n times q, and we said, are those numbers 10 or more? There's no math happening here, so we're just going to think about in the context of our problem, all right, which some students can get disappointed by. Yes, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh huh. Correct. It's going to be exactly like that, but instead of success failure, it's going to say a large enough sample condition. So I'm still going to organize it that way. That's how my brain organizes it. All right. But I don't know if I said this yesterday. You can organize it the way that I'm doing it, or you can just write sentences. It doesn't matter. Okay. Now, I want you to focus on this formula. And a couple of things. You need to know some notation here. And if you don't know the notation, the actual symbols, this means nothing to you. All right? So first you need to know that SD means standard deviation. Do you remember what Y bar means? Sample. Sample. No, so the proportions were yesterday. Sample. What are we doing today? What are we doing today? No, sad. No. Sad. Sample mean. Y bar is a sample mean. All right. So you'll notice this is a sample mean. All right. Do you remember the symbol for the population mean? What's the symbol for the population mean? P is remember he's yesterday. He's for proportions yesterday. 
No, not the hat. It's this symbol. Mu is right. Right, mu is the population mean. So when we find the standard deviation for the sample mean, we take the population standard deviation, this is sigma, and divide it by the square root of our sample size n. All right, so that's really the only difference between looking at the population model and a sampling distribution model for a sample mean. All right, we have to divide by that square root of n. Sigma is the population standard deviation. Population standard deviation. Mu, sigma. What do you mean together? Well, mu and sigma are, I usually think of them together because those are, are the parameters for a model. Well, like sigma doesn't just mean population. Sigma means, this, sigma, this always means population standard deviation. Always, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. It's all one thing. The population standard deviation. So, Natalie, if I had put this letter, S, you see the letter S? That's the sample standard deviation. So that's the difference. Yes, I can. Let me just put them together. So mu, sigma, y bar, s. These are the same thing, but one is for the population and one is for a sample. So mu and sigma are population parameters. Y bar and s are called sample statistics. We calculate them. Using Excel, we'll calculate the mean and standard deviation. Wait, mu and o are what? Not O. Mu and sigma are population parameters. And, then the other one? and I'll tell you this. Usually, they give them to us, or guys, most likely, we don't, we don't know what they are. Like, if I asked you, what is the average height of American women? Does anyone know? Not, no one knows because we have not taken the height of every American woman. We could not do that physically, fiscally, can't do it, right? So we take samples to then use that sample to say, here's what we think it is. All right, so if you ever Google what's the height of American women on average, they're giving you sample statistics, not a population parameter. Yes. Y bar. And S are from samples. They're sample statistics. So, uh, population, uh, that's like, like, world, like real data? Well, it can be from real data. Most likely, what they tell us here is based on historical data. They're saying over 15 years, they've gathered data and they think this is what the population parameters are. And then we say, okay, great, let's take a sample, a small sample of that and calculate some statistics, we would use y bar and s. It's kind of like how when you go into Spanish class, you need to write in Spanish. You need to use the correct language, right? I don't know if that, that works for you, but that's, that's how I viewed it. It's like a, almost like a different language. OK? All right. OK. Now, what we're going to do today all right, is we're going to kind of try to make this bridge from what we call the real world, where we actually have data, into the theoretical model world. All right, so that's what all this is really talking about, using these sampling distribu distribution models to do that. All right, so that's ultimately what the goal is for today. All right, and you're going to see when we do this example, it's going to look very similar to yesterday. All right, all right last slide. I wanted to kind of summarize here at the end. When we think about this, all of our sampling that we do, right, if we were to take a sample today and get a statistic from it, and then tomorrow we do another sample and get that statistic, they will be different. And that's not because we did anything wrong. That's just called sampling variability which is really where a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in this class, a lot of the concepts that we've discussed so far, have come from that idea of can we measure that sampling variability, all right? So sometimes you hear or you might read this idea that's called sampling error, 
But usually when you read error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, you guys think error means wrong or incorrect, right? When you see that word error, yeah. you think someone's made a mistake. But in stats, we don't view it that way. We view sampling error as a good thing, as variability, as something that we can try to measure and know, not as a negative. All right. Can we try a problem together? Yeah. Excellent. So flip over. You need, I think you need to flip again. There should be two big slides that we're going to work on together. Excellent. Should look like this. Let me see it. All right. Let's have Julissa. Do you mind reading this for us? And you even read in the parentheses. Thank you so much, Julissa. That was very nice of you. Some students still. So thank you. All right. So when I first read that. It gave us SAT score should have a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. What did they just give us? They gave us the population, mean, and standard deviation. So here we go. See if your brain can do this. What symbols should I use for population parameters? Mu and sigma. Let's do it. You should. We're definitely going to do a Kahoot many times on just the notation for this class. All right. An answer response. What do you mean? Sorry. Oh, yes, yes. It'll be, you're going to be like, wow, this seems a lot like yesterday. It's going to be very similar to yesterday. Yes, Diana. Yeah, I'm Mr. Vrandrick, not Mr. Mew. <laughs> Correct. So let's write down first statements I must say in order to make it OK to make this sampling distribution model. The first statement is the independence assumption. And just like yesterday, I do not abbreviate assumption. You'll get there. OK? So let's think about this. Do I believe that 20 students that took the SAT are independent of one another? Yes. Why, Pablo? I'm taking a random sample of 20 students. Does it say where I'm getting that sample? No. So it's from a nationwide population. Yeah, no, the odds of having two students from even the same school district, let alone city or state, is low. So do we think that if a student gets a 1,500, will that affect the next student's score? No. No. So we say that they are independent. That's what we're saying. And so what you should write down right now is, I think student SAT scores are independent. I think student SAT scores are independent. Bless you. Is it? I thought it was SAT. SAT. It doesn't. I mean, I don't know. You write ACT. I, it's all good. I know you guys are still in the ACT era for our school, but we're transitioning to SAT. A great question, Natalie. No idea. Oh, I said why. I was like, I don't know. Okay. Now, because we don't actually know if what we just wrote is true, we check two conditions. The first one is the randomization condition. And let's think. Did Julissa read anything for us that made us think that this sample of 20 students is a random sample? It's right there. It's right there. Random samples of 20 students. So if I was going to write a sentence right next to the randomization condition, I would write down, problem said, random samples of 20 students. I would write down something that says, 
random samples of 20 students. What's the other condition that I'm going to write under here? Not that one yet. The 10% condition. Now we can actually do some math here. What is our sample size? Sample size is 20. So n equals 20. Yesterday I told you to take that number and multiply it by 10. 200. So ask yourself, are there more than 200 students who take the SAT each year? Absolutely. Way more than that. All right? So what we're saying with this 10% condition is that our sample size of 20 is not too large. So you should write that down. Sample size of 20 is not too large. Sample size of 20 is not too large. Now, what if you don't, right? Well, I have to think in my brain. Do I think there's more than 200 students who took the SAT? Yes, so we're good. If you say no to that question, then you might have some problems. All right? So hopefully when we do problems in this class, you're always going to say yes to that. Yes? Wait, so where did you get 200? How did I get the 200? So I, I always multiply the sample size times 10, and then I think about that number, because if I have more than that, then my sample is not too big compared to the population. Then you have problems. You would say, I'm worried, because I think my sample size is too large. So I'm going to do everything, but just letting you know I'm worried about that. So is it possible the, it possible the actual mean of the number is not too so large? Are you thinking about these numbers compared to those up there? Yeah. Don't do that. So I don't ever reference those until I start doing the model part. When I'm doing the assumptions and conditions, I'm just thinking about sample size. All right? All right. Everybody okay on the independence assumption? Let's move to the other assumption. What's the other assumption? Sample size assumption. Diana, question? You multiply by 10 because you said it's not exactly. Exactly. Pablo, she was not here yesterday. Stop being mean. <laughs> No, I'm doing the assumption first. The sample size assumption, you should write this down, is that 20 students is a large enough sample. You should write down next to sample size assumption, 20 students is a large enough sample. Now, kind of what Alyssa and Diana were kind of thinking, maybe Lily as well, you're thinking, how do you know? Do we know if 20 students is large enough? We don't, but we can check a condition, and that condition is called, something different from yesterday, the large enough sample condition. I know, right? They really use a lot of brain power to name these things. The large, I got one sample. The large enough sample condition. Now, this is where it's challenging because it's unfamiliar to you. Do you remember when Jalissa read the stuff in parentheses? It says, we believe a normal model applies to the population. So if you think the population distribution looks normal, then I'm not worried about small sample sizes. But what if they had said, we believe the population distribution looks skewed to the left? Then I'm worried about 20 being small. All right? Because the central limit theorem says that as long as our sample size is large enough, even if the population distribution doesn't look normal, we are still good to use the normal model for this sampling distribution model. But if the population distribution doesn't look unimodal and symmetric, 
then we have to have a bigger sample. So there's always this relationship between what does the population distribution look like and how big is our sample? Yes. Can I, sorry, can I say one thing before you? I'm sorry, one more thing popped in my head. So if our sample size had been 20,000 students, that's a large sample, so I wouldn't really care what the population distribution looks like. Okay, okay go, sorry. Okay, so even on the problem yesterday, it included the sample size a different condition, yeah. When to use which one? Yeah. So for the success failure, everything's the same, right? Except for that condition. It's asking yourself, is this problem about proportions or about means? Right? And so this said a mean of 500. Yesterday's problem said a proportion of speeders at 80%. So looking for percentages or not percentages? Or like a number, like always think, are there only two options? If there's only two options, it's got to be proportions. There's not only two options for the SAT score. There's anything from whatever the minimum is so to 1,600. It's means. All right? Excellent. OK. Are we ready to make it? Excellent. Let's make it. So I want you to draw. Oh, yeah, what I said. The statement I said was, or maybe I didn't say to write this, my bad. Because the problem says the population looks normal, I'm not worried about a small sample size. So basically, you can say refer to the parentheses. Anything, anything not unimodal and symmetric, then I have to think about the sample size, Diana. If the population doesn't look unimodal and symmetric, then I'm hoping that my sample size is, is fairly large. But if your population looks normal, then I don't care how small the sample is, it's going to look normal too. Yeah? Let's say it didn't say it was normal. Then I would say, I'm worried about this small sample size because I don't know what the population distribution looks like. That's what I would write, and then I would do all the work. Like, you think of it as like you're writing a report for someone to read. Another statistician is going to read your work and make their decision based on what you wrote. So you're telling the statistician reading it, I'm worried about the sample size being small. And then they can make a decision on if they are, you know, going to say, okay, you're right, I'm worried, I'm not going to use this, or you know what, I'm okay, I'm going to use what you did. Can we just do it and then maybe it'll be okay? We're, we're going to do tons of these. All right. Let's draw our curve. And just like yesterday, take about mm, 50 to 75% of the page. Draw the curve. I mean, just do your best. Doesn't need to be. Mine's not perfect either. Yes, it took me 10 years to perfect this. I also did this when I was 16, so it's been longer than that. Great. Guys, I'm not, I'm not going to use what? Oh, I'm not done. I just drew like the curve. All right, so. What, Amanda? What did you say? What did you say about me? Mm, I want to be an engineer because my dad was an engineer and I want to make him proud. And then when I was a freshman in college, I said, Dad, I don't want to be an engineer. And I was really worried he's going to be disappointed in me. And he said, well, that, that's fine. Aww. He was cool with it. And then I wanted to be an accountant. Then I did that for a few summers. Like, this is boring. And then I did a teaching program for two years. And I was like, this is more like what I'm good at. I feel like I kind of changed the degree program. No, because my school had a first year studies thing that we did. So we all did kind of basic stuff. So I wasn't behind. We had to decide by the end of sophomore year. So we had a lot of time. Huh? Everybody hates accounting. You know what's nice about having an accounting job? You get paid. Woo! Okay. For a normal model, I need two parameters. What are the parameters I need? 
Mu and Sigma. Mu and Sigma. Right? Or as we say, the the Wiki Owl. Giuseppe, I need you to write this down. All right, you can do push-ups on your own time. All right, right now we're doing push-ups for your brain. So now, for what I want to use, what does N mean? N, capital M means the normal model. The normal model. I need mu is going to be the same, that 500 number. But now, check it, here we go. It's going to be sigma over the square root of N, which is a formula you do not need to memorize. It will be given to you. N means? No, the little n. The sample size. The sample size. So we're going to write down 500, comma, and let's see what that is. Our standard deviation was 100 over the square root of 20. Could someone take out a calculator, their phone, and do 100 divided by the square root of 20, please? Excellent. One person. Thank you. Two people. Yeah. Yes. Sample size. Anyone? 100 divided by the square root of 20. Is that the... 22.4? Is it 22.4? Love it. 22.4. Now, I want you to see, guys, I want you to see that when we did this, we started with, if we were looking at the population, the sigma would be 100. But now what is our sigma for this sampling distribution model for a sample mean? Smaller. You see how much smaller it is? It's 22.4. That's a big difference. So just keep that in mind. We're going to be talking more about that for the next few weeks. About that's called. So if I were to just use the normal model for the population, it'd be 500 comma 100 from the problem. But now it's 500 comma 22.4. That's much smaller. It's not going to have as much variability in the model. Because if I was doing the, no the population, it'd be 500, 600, 700, 800, 400, 300, 200. Right? That's what it would look like. But now when I use 22.4, we're not even going to get out of like past 600. Okay, so what goes down the middle? I have to Lexi, go ahead. I have yeah. Where did I get 120? Oh, it's 25. You're good. Oh. <coughs> Bless, you. Bless you. Okay. So take 500 and add 22.4. You get 522.4. Then what do you get? 524. Then again? Uh, 544.8. Again? What is it? Yep, that's right. Okay, go the other way. 500 minus 22.4. What is it, Bashir? Do you do it again? And again. Thanks, Bashir. Appreciate you. All right. Now, once you finish doing that, you know what time it is. You ready? The sentence! And by sentence, I mean plural. Sentences. You ready? Here we go. Get your writing shoes on. According to the model, I expect 68% of my samples of 20 students to have SAT scores between 477.6 and 522.4. Why did I choose 68% to start? Why did I choose that? Anybody remember from yesterday? Why did, uh, uh, Lily is asking, why did we use 68%? I think she understands the all. There's a rule we talked about in the first semester called the 68, 95, and 99.7 rule. That basically states if you have a normal model, 68% of your data will fall between one standard deviation above and below the mean. 
95% of your data will fall between two standard deviations above and below the mean, and 99.7% of the data, so that's almost all the data, will fall between three standard deviations above and three standard deviations below the mean. All right, which is why I didn't go any further past three above and three below. Yes? Sixty-eight percent is one standard deviation above and below. So, do you guys see why I chose forty-seven, four hundred seventy-seven point six, and five twenty-two point four? Because those are one above and one below. So now here we go. I expect ninety-five percent of my samples of twenty students to have SAT scores between four fifty-five point two and five forty-four point eight. Well, because think of it like this. Think of it like if I'm in the mean, all right, and as I move further, I'm going to start gathering other samples out there. So I'm going to have more and more in there. Think of it like a net, capturing more and more of them. So. 400, so I'm saying that if I were to do, if I were to ask every student in this school to give me a sample of 20 nationwide students who took the SAT and tell me their average for their 20 in their sample, I'm expecting 68% of the students at the school who give me their samples to have averages between 477.6 and 522.4, 522.4. That's what I'm expecting. And that's, con that's confusing because it's the first time you're ever hearing that. I expect 99.7% of my samples of 20 students to have SAT scores between 432.8 and 567.2. And I'll try to summarize, Pablo, that might help, OK? So here's the summary that I think, I hope, is helpful to you. Let's say I ask all 550 Christo Road Jesuit students to help me out and to run a sample of 20 students, okay? So tomorrow morning, every student walks in the building and they walk by me and they say, my number is, and they're gonna tell me their average, all right? So like Jimena, Jimena walks by me and she says, Mr. Vrander, my average was 518, okay? Let's say Viviana walks by me and says, my average was 483. See what I'm saying here? Yes? Yes, everybody good? Let's say Giuseppe says, Mr. Frederick, my average was 410. Giuseppe says, my average for my 20 students was 410. What would we say about 410? It's unusual because it's below 432.8. And so what if Heidi says, my average was 600? In the other direction, still unusual, but in the other direction. It's unusually high. Did they do anything wrong? No. Their 20 students just happened to give them an unusual statistic. Question? Okay, so on the quiz, it's, uh, so do we have to, so like every other sentence that we've written before that, uh -huh. we have to use the whole entire thing? I'll explain exactly what I'm expecting on the quiz tomorrow. Can I wait, can I just hold off on that? The quiz is Friday, but I'll make sure you know what's going to go happen going to go down on Friday tomorrow. Okay? All right. Thank you for listening. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this video about sampling distribution models for means. All right. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Catch you next time. We out.